webinars for condos and co-ops. My name is Jules Frankel, and I'm a shareholder with Wilkin & Garden Plan who spends a significant amount of time working with condos and co-ops. Let's go through a few housekeeping uh, items before we get started. Use the questions pane in the GoToWebinar dashboard to submit any questions or comments you have as we proceed through the presentation. We will either address them as we go or hold some of them and address them at the end. We promise we will keep this presentation to a maximum of one hour. At the end, there will be a slide with the presenter's contact information. A recording of the webinar, as well as copies of the slides, will be placed on our website, www.wgcpas.com. You can also find recordings of past webinars there, along with other resources for your building. Please keep an eye out for additional webinars that we have coming up. If for some reason you can't hear us or the sound is a problem, please send us a message using that questions pane. Finally, we welcome your feedback as to suggestions for future programs or comments on this program. Moving on to tonight's program. This is the time of year where most associations are budgeting what their fees will be for the upcoming year. So what we'll be doing in this program is basically dividing it into two parts. Number one, how to budget for the monies that you want to have coming in. And we'll cover basic budgeting rules, prior year deficits, and other financial topics. And the second part of the program will be how to collect it if any of your uh, condo owners or shareholders aren't paying it. Our presenters are Annette Murray from Wilkin & Gun Plan and Dean Roberts of Norris, McLaughlin & Marcus. Annette is a shareholder of Wilkin & Gun Plan. She has extensive experience working with condos and co-ops and provides them with accounting, audit, and consulting services. Dean practices in condominium and co-op law, real estate and land use matters, and commercial litigation. He is based in Norris, McLaughlin & Marcus' New York City office. His area of focus is real estate litigation with a subspecialty in the representation of cooperative housing corporations and condominiums. At the time his prior firm merged with Norris, McLaughlin & Marcus, Dean was the managing director of the landlord and tenant practice and had been working in the condo co-op area for almost two decades. Dean has handled all facets of condominium and cooperative ownership from sponsor purchase and conversion to representing well-established tenant shareholder boards of directors. A substantial portion of his practice consists of representing cooperative corporations and moderate income co-ops in all areas of litigation, including landlord-tenant litigation. So we'll start first on the financial side with budgeting. And at this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Annette. Thank you, Joel. Very happy to be on the webinar this evening with you all. And we're going to be covering budget issues this evening. I'm first going to go over some basic budgeting procedures. Then I'm going to be discussing some special areas of concern that are of concern to board members and management. And then we're also going to talk about some other sources of revenue. All right. I'm getting used to my clicker here. All right. Um, here we go. Under special areas of concerns, we will be covering reserves, bad debts, prior year deficits, contingency line items in the budget, FHA requirements, which some boards of management are interested in complying with and other boards are not interested in uh, complying with, and then some other sources of revenue. And then again, as Joseph said, we're going to be covering uh, collections with Dean. Basic budgeting procedures. Now, some of you on attending this evening have sophisticated backgrounds with budgets, and then we might have some new board members or, or new managers who are relatively new to the budget process, so that we thought we'd go over some basic budgeting procedures or budgeting rules. And as part of that process, you do need to get several pieces of information together and do your homework. One of the things that you want to have handy and to take a look at is the prior year audited financial statements. You want to have the most current year-to-date financial statements available so that you could determine the estimated current year expenses. A lot of times what we also need to do is obtain current contracts that are in place 
that are going to cross over from 2011 to 2012 and get any contracts that are in place for next year and obtain any estimates for planned projects that you're aware of. And then we really need to come up with an estimate of the upcoming year expenses. So Annette, when you estimate year-to-date expenses and amounts for next year, what are some of the issues that a board member or a property manager should be aware of? All right, thanks, Joel. For annual expenses, what you need to remember is that you just can't annualize the 9 or 12 months year-to-date for every single type of line item. For example, there might be contract signs in effect for the last month of the year for special projects, so therefore you can't you know, take that number and annualize it. Uh, for next year, all planned projects and signed contracts need to be considered. Uh, another example would also be items such as insurance and things like that, that you can't look at the year-to-date numbers and assume that you just um, annualize that to come up with your line item. All right, when you're coming up with your um, expense numbers for the next fiscal year, you really do need to be conservative. Future year budget expenses should not be lower in almost every case than current year actual, unless you know, for instance, that you have a price reduction in certain line items. Budget should include contracted costs plus some extra costs because things do come up that you don't expect. Um, one of the items that we could talk about is though are reducing some expenses. There are things such as having an insurance coverage review performed and send the insurance out to bid. Um, one thing that the board the manager can consider is increasing insurance deductibles. Another idea is to have a formal preventative maintenance plan in place for major building systems and your high traffic areas, such as lobbies and hallways. And by having the maintenance plan, as well as performing regular inspections of major building systems, you keep up on the repairs and you really do uh, minimize the chance of any major breakdowns, which then can cost much more money that might not be anticipated in the budget. Another item that's becoming, I think, more and more spoken about is considering sub-metering utilities. Um, since the cost of utilities has become such a large percentage of the budget, items such as electric and water are such a huge percentage of that, that considering sub-metering is really going back to the unit owners and the shareholders that are really generating those charges. So there's been a lot of talk about that. Another item um, that could be thought about is having a water cost analysis done to find some hidden leaks. And also, which I know a lot of uh, the management companies that have been doing a great job, is really considering having a professional energy study done to see what some of the net economic benefits can be from doing some systems upgrades. So that's really kind of some of the basic budgeting. Um, another big area, though, is communicating the budget to unit owners. And it really should be clear to the unit owners that the majority of the budget is fixed costs. A great way of doing that is for management or a board member to put together like a pie chart of the various expenses. For instance, the co-op, the real estate taxes, and the mortgage payments make up a substantial part of the budget, as well as utilities, staffing, and insurance. Management and the board have very little control over those specific line items. So between a letter going to the unit owners and the shareholders, explaining the budget, explaining the increases, going over any detailed line items, and also perhaps a chart or a pie chart, that would be very helpful for the owners to understand why the maintenance fees of the common charges are going up. All right, now we're going to cover some special areas of concern. One of the large items um, that does come up is that the concern for resale value and maintaining the property well is taking care of long-term replacement items that need to be taken care of in the building. Um, what most of the buildings call this is the money they've got set aside as reserves or funding for major repairs and replacements and how to fund for those items and make those capital improvements. And one question that we frequently get is how much should be in reserves? There's no one answer on that. Um, a lot of people in the know like to talk about rules of thumb. It's not something we generally recommend, but an example of a rule of thumb would be, you know, Three to six months of maintenance fees should be in the reserves, and that should cover anything that might come up. Another example might be, well, in our building, we have $8,000 for every unit, and that's how much we try and keep in our reserves. But what we really suggest is a five-year capital plan. And how that works is, is that management and the board would work with an engineer to come up with the major line items and projects that need to get done in a building over the next five years, and it's really the best way to assess the capital needs of a building. And then you also prepare a five-year cash flow plan and how to fund it. 
And it really minimizes the chance of a large unplanned expenditure if you have an engineer come in and take a look at the major components and say, these are really the items that there's a good chance it's going to have to get replaced over the next few years. And then you work together with the cash flow plan to figure out how to pay for it. So now the question is, how can we fund for capital improvements? There's a lot of different ways. I'm going to go back on that. There are several different ways to fund for capital improvements. And the first one is a capital assessment, which um, many of you are familiar with. Another way to fund would be to have the buildings have access to a credit line for co-ops. There's refinancing the mortgage. Another way is to actually have a budget line item called reserve funding or capital improvement expenditures for the year. And then the fifth alternative really is to do a combination of any of the above so that there is enough funds on hand to handle that. So now one of the questions that board members ask us all the time is, what should we do? Should we do a capital assessment? Should we refinance? Should we use a budget line? So what do, you, what do you think are some of the advantages and disadvantages of each one of these techniques? All right. Now in regards to a capital assessment, one of the things that a capital assessment does, it does help keep the maintenance fees steady. So there's no impact on the monthly common charge or the monthly maintenance fee. Um, and it can be payable over a shorter period of time to escalate the cash flow. So you're getting the cash into the building account so they can pay the vendors and get those projects done. Also, when you have a capital assessment, it's usually an easier sell to the owners because you're really indicating what the money is being collected for. For instance, you know, a boiler replacement, elevator refurbishment, and the such. A disadvantage is that it really can be a financial hardship on some unit owners. Uh, as we know, you know, we, we are still in throes of a pretty deep economic downturn, and a lot of the buildings are really having a hard time getting to pass just small carrying charge increases in their budget, never mind coming in and asking for a capital assessment. Um, also, it, it is possible in some cases that if a building does too many capital assessments, when lenders come in to really assess the building, there could be some concern by the mortgage company there. Now, if there was uh, either the use of a credit line or refinancing a co-op mortgage or a combination of the two, the good thing about that, there's usually not as large a financial impact for unit and shareholders than there is as a capital assessment. You know, it's a little bit of a, a softer feel. Yes, will the maintenance fees go up to handle the debt service? Absolutely. But it's not as much as that um, individual capital services. But by going through um, outside financing, the total cost usually is more money than doing a capital assessment because you already have the uh, interest component of borrowing that money over the um, determined time that board and management think it's best. Now, the option of using a budgeted line item as an expense and calling it reserve funding or call it capital improvement, capital project funding, this way um, the extra revenue that you need to collect is actually built into the monthly common charge or maintenance fees that are billed and collected, and it might be easier for unit owners to pay it over a 12-month period as opposed to a capital assessment, which maybe might need to be billed over a three- or six-month period. So, um, but again, there's pros and cons to every one of those avenues. Um, but we are seeing that most of the buildings are doing a combination of some of the options. All right, now we're going to talk about bad debt. We are seeing across the board, um, we handle probably in excess of six, 700 buildings, and we're probably not seeing one audit at December 2010 that did not have bad debt expense. There are, um, in every, whether you're condo, co-op, large or small, there are definitely a lot of issues with collections, and Dean's going to help us out understanding that all in a few minutes. So the bad debts, unfortunately, are definitely increasing on both sides of the river. Um, and just to understand from an accounting standpoint what some of the issues are, that usually for a condominium, the bad debt expense actually gets recorded on the books and records of the condominium. And an estimate is set up um, usually annually, but sometimes more often. And because uh, they, they have different avenues of getting the collections of the common charges for the condominiums. For co-ops, a bad debt is not usually set up on the books and records. But what I think both condominiums and co-ops need to do is they really should consider putting a bad debt line item in their 2012 budget so that there's a way to capture some cash coming into the building to offset those unit owners and shareholders that might not be paying their common charges and maintenance fees. So in either condos or co-ops, the non-payment of the common charges and maintenance fees can impact the cash flow of the building in a significant way. And depending on how many units your building is, you know, it can really have a huge impact. 
And one of the things that you need to do is to consider how many unit owners are currently not paying. Um, are there payment plans in place with them so you think they might get paid up by the end of the year? Or are those same unit owners not going to be paying more, most likely into 2012? And if that's the case, you can actually come up with a schedule and prepare what you think your bad debt um, might not be collected. So what you need to do is you estimate the amount of the current year fees that might not be collected. Um, you want to consider unit owners that are more than a year past due, or if you're aware of someone that they've walked away from a unit or something like that, you definitely want to include those. And you want to calculate in your bad debt expense the annual common charges for the unit, plus any expected late fees and legal fees, and any capital assessments as well. Then also a process should be done to discuss with the attorney what or if any of those parts might not be collectible. All right. And that's really everything in the bad debts. Again, legal fees, late fees, capital assessments, you know, all those should be considered if you think you're not going to collect them and it could impact your cash flow in 2012. The next item we're going to talk about is prior year deficits and surpluses. Now, I'd like to say that we see a lot of uh, prior year surpluses to carry over into the current year, but I really have to say that based upon the 2010 audits, a lot of buildings were running at a deficit, and a lot of times it was due to bad debt and excess expenses that weren't anticipated. So prior year operating surpluses, while they're not common, have been used to offset current year common charge increases. So if a building, for instance, has a $50,000 surplus, the cash is in the bank, it's been um, agreed to, to the prior year's audited financial statement, the board and manager definitely have the opportunity to use part of that $50,000 as a revenue source in their 2012 budget to offset any increase. What we usually see, though, unfortunately, is the prior year deficit. And we, they really do need to be dealt with. If they're not dealt with, there really can be a severe cash flow impact to the building. And while this might be a hard sell to board members and also, also to the unit owners, if there's not enough cash in the bank to pay the bills, that is not anything that any of the vendors or really any of the board members want to have to deal with. So how do we deal with the prior year operating fund deficit? There's a few ways. One is to do an additional assessment or a special assessment. Another way that you can handle that is to do a budget and line item as an expense and call it prior year deficit. So an example would be if a building has a cumulative deficit going into 2011 or 2012, let's say $40,000, the board could decide to deal with it by recovering $20,000 of it over a two-year period. So you'd put um, a deficit line reduction expense line in your 2012 and 2013 budget of, say, $20,000 apiece. Or if you feel that you need to spread it out over four years, you could do the $10,000 apiece. But it really is recommended to recoup the cumulative deficit as quickly as possible so that the building doesn't end up having any cash flow problems. Another line item that we like to see in the budget to soften and reduce the chance of any deficit having is really to have a contingency line item. Um, it could be called contingency. In layman's terms, you could say it's a cushion in the budget, but we really should have that because very often there are unanticipated repairs or there's unanticipated price increases that aren't anticipated and um, you know are more than expected and they really do need to be dealt with. And the question that we get is how much should the contingency line item be? And it really ranges based upon the size of the buildings, but it is very subjective and it's also what can the budget afford and you know what, can, what kind of percentage increase can the residents afford. So it really is very subjective. But depending on the size of the building, we, we have seen operating contingencies from anywhere from 1% to 5% of total operating expenses. So Annette, I see that one of our listeners has sent in a question uh, for us. They want to know, how often do we see budgets with the contingency line items? And are you seeing them more frequently lately or less frequently? Well, currently we're really not seeing them often enough. And the, how we can tell that is one, you know, the line item is actually not available on the budget, and we are really seeing a lot of, lot of deficits. So the last couple of years we're seeing the deficits, and we're not seeing the contingency line items in the budgets because some of the other um, price increases and line items that have had to go up 
um, are really taking the place of what a board might have previously considered to put on a contingency line. So again, while a carrying charge maintenance fee increase is very, very difficult for the board and for the unit owners to deal with, it really is something sometimes that needs to get done. And one way to put some cushion into the budget is with a contingency line item. So to the degree that you can get a contingency line item to fit into your 2012 budget, it really is something that uh, would be great to do. Now something else that's been talked about quite a bit the last couple of years are FHA requirements. And the FHA actually just came out effective June 30th with a whole um, guide on their FHA requirements for condominium projects and approval. One of the things that we want to talk about with the FHA requirements is that board and management really should be ready for a discussion from unit owners that are interested, that might want to sell the unit owners and the real estate brokers and potential unit owners are coming to them with the idea that they'd like to get an FHA mortgage. And the only way they can get an FHA mortgage is for the building to be approved and that they're all um, in compliance with the FHA rules. And from a financial standpoint, while there's many FHA requirements, there's a couple of financial ones that we wanted to point out tonight that you need to be aware of whether, whether or not you want to go down that road and if the board doesn't want to go down that road to be able to explain to you owners why. And probably the largest one, which some of you might be familiar with already, is the FHA requirement of that 10% of the budget provides for funding of replacement reserves for capital expenditures of 10% of the budget. And what that means is if a building has a million dollar total common charges or maintenance fees, that of that million dollar of expenses, 100000 is going into the reserve fund. So for a building that currently has no annual allocation towards reserves, that would be a tremendous maintenance fee increase, you know, percentage-wise. So while unit owners might want to come to the Board of Management and say, we really do want to be in compliance with the FHA funding requirement, we'll say, okay, that's terrific, but it's going to result in an X percent increase in order to be in compliance with that. And then when it's looked at from that standpoint, um, that's one of the concerns is that the uh, common charges maintenance charges are going to have to go up too much and no one wants to absorb that. And then there's a different issue, especially in the co-op world with um, financial compliance and being able to qualify to move into the building, is that you don't, you know, it's not going to work. Because a lot of the FHA mortgages are very, have very low percentage down payments and they won't meet the requirements of a specific building. Um, the other thing that the FHA requirements are looking for is, um, is that the budget must provide adequate funding for insurance coverage um, for all insurance coverage and deductibles. And we know all the budgets include line items for insurance, but some of the deductibles are substantial. And it could be that the FHA could kick back a budget and say, you know, we see that you've covered all your insurance premiums. You know, where are you going to handle the deductibles if there is a deductible? Well, if you had a contingency line item in the budget, that would handle it. You know, and you'd be able to respond to the FHA that way. But maybe you want to put the description on the budget that says insurance and deductibles. And so that could help deal with some of that. So we kind of talked about expenses and some of the, uh, the downside of the budget. And is there any possibility of any other sources of revenue? And you know, some of these you might have considered over the years and you know, have decided not to go down the path of some of them. But maybe now is the time to take a look at them. Many buildings have flip fees, but not all of them do. So there is the issue of implementing flip fees, or now perhaps is the time to increase the flip fee. Many buildings have storage units and storage bins that they rent out. Um, we've had several buildings now. They have, you know, the, and the, all the unit owners, for instance, in a, I should say in a co-op, they decided to approve to sell the storage units and said, assign some shares to those storage units and then charge maintenance fees on them. So they get the revenue coming in as well um, from the sale of the storage units as well as from the carrying charges. For the buildings that have commercial leases, they really should make sure that the commercial leases are at market rents when it comes up time. Uh, and, you know, before lease time, they really need to understand what the market rents are. And you really need to make sure that you work with your attorney and that the attorney carefully reviews the commercial lease. So, and the commercial leases should include items such as tax escalation clauses to make sure that you get that money, extra money, and as well as you know, a minimum of a CPI increases every year. 
then a lot of times there is the opportunity to look up to get some revenues. Again, to the degree that you can get cell towers, air rights, a lot of buildings have possibilities of outdoor terraces they could put in for rental or for sale, so that's something to be considered. And we actually have a number of clients that have used the outside and the inside of their buildings for film and video crew shooting. And again, that comes with its challenges, but it might be worth something pursuing. And the last item really is for the board and management to take a look around the building and see if there really is any unused space to convert into uh, any storage rooms and get some revenues there. And if I may, one area where we have seen a way to generate more revenue in both Catano and Co-op is to go back and review your amenity fee. A lot of the co-ops have underpriced parking, and the parking can sometimes be used more effectively. Another big component, especially in buildings that have uh, investor-owned rental units, you know, subtenants in them, is move out, move in fees that are in part or fully not refundable, which turns out to be a decent revenue producer if you're charging someone $500 to move in and out. You know, it's a nice secret flip tax. That's some great advice there. So we got a couple of questions that came in from some of the listeners. Um, the first question is, these are some great sources of revenue, but they want to know, Annette, is there such thing as a free lunch are there any tax implications to this, or uh, do we just get to keep all this money? Well, as we know, two things are certain, and they're death and taxes, so I'm going to talk about the more pleasant of the two, which are taxes, Jules, and there definitely are tax implications to these sources of revenue. In the condominium world, um, tax, the items of revenue to a condominium that are not taxed are considered membership income. Many of these other types of revenue sources we talked about are considered non-membership income because they've not come from any of the members. So, for instance, cell towers, air rights, uh, film and video uh, proceeds, you know, shooting proceeds that might come in absolutely would be taxable. So, and in the co-op world, we have the concept of patronage versus non-patronage revenues. So, when dealing these great sources of revenues and management appropriately wants to put them in the following year's budget, when you know that you're going to be getting them, you really do need to consider what taxes do need to be paid on them so that the correct net amount of revenue is going to be put on that budget. So when the time comes and it looks like you're really going to get some of these revenues, you know, don't hesitate to give us a call and we'll help figure out whether that line item would be taxable and then what would be the appropriate amount of taxes to put on your um, budget for the next year. So another question came in from a topic you covered a couple of minutes ago. Uh, the listener is asking, what is an appropriate reserve value at the maximum level, top dollar? It's a great question. And as I indicated earlier, Wilkins Garden Plan, we're fortunate enough to have many, many co-op and condo clients. And we have yet to see a building that's ever had too much money. So if an example would be if, if the building did do a five-year capital plan, and the five-year capital plan said that in the next five years you need to spend $1.2 million dollars, and the building already had $1.2 million in the bank, I would say you're in great shape. You know, there you do have an appropriate value at the maximum level because you don't have to worry about going about either assessing a capital assessment, going for financing, you know, or anything like that. But we really never do see an, a dollar amount that's too much unless you know you fully funded. And I know Dean's got something to add also. Oh, another important component that I'd like to emphasize on the reserve fund because one of the issues that's coming up more and more is banks have been doing a much more thorough due diligence on their financial review of co-ops and we're starting to see a real tightening of lending for buyers and one of the big ticket items they always look at is what is your reserve fund and that you know it's critical for banks that you have an ample reserve fund because it protects from assessment and it gives them some confidence that you're not going to get blown up by a boiler replacement project that's going to throw everything out of whack. Plus, for prospective buyers, you know, you have to stress to them that the added value, it's like a bank account that they own whatever their percentage interest is in the condo or co-op, they are invested as an asset for them, and it seems to be a real band-aid for concerns about if there are any issues, if it's an older building, if it needs a new roof, you know, uh, 
buyers in New York are pretty bad about the inspection side of it, but they're starting to get more and more aware of it because buyers council will ask, have you done a you know a site survey? Have you done a capital needs survey? And that loops back to what's your reserve fund? And as was said, you can't have too much, but you can always have too little. And that is a big sticking point for banks. It's come up three or four times in the last six months where the issue for the lender was the reserve funds were insufficient. And one of the things, you know, we see we see some buildings, you know, that have annual budgets in the millions of dollars, and when you go look at their balance sheet to how much to see what they have set aside for reserves cumulatively, they might only have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank at the end of the year. I mean, logically, you, you're looking at a huge asset, a huge building that has a lot of needs, and there's all, there's very little money in the bank. So it really is something that needs to get addressed. So Annette told us a little bit about how to plan for the money we're trying to bring in through the budget process. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dean to talk about how do we collect this money, how do we get this money, and what are some of the challenges and the ways that boards can deal with challenging situations? Uh, thank you, Joel. Um, I want to approach the issue of collections as a twofold thing. First, there's the basic concept of collection, and that is how do you pursue and resolve unit owners and shareholders who fail to honor their obligation to pay maintenance or common charges? And that's, that's a pretty straightforward uh, discussion. We'll have that in a moment. But the other side of it, which is critically important, and I think in many ways the more important of the concepts, is avoidance of arrears as much as possible. And that, that really involves being proactive and preemptive in how you address them. And that is, you're going to have ARs. And as we know, these are tough economic times, and the AR problem is more acute than it has been historically. You know, we all, all my clients tend to have more arrears, tend to have shareholders or unit owners in distress, have foreclosures. Uh, recently, we had a case where someone walked away from a co-op, which happened in the early 90s, the last time the real estate market in New York came to an end. Um, so these are real issues that have real meaning, both for the unit owners, but especially for the buildings themselves because it can be such a drag on your budget. To start with, I would like to discuss a core difference between condos and co-ops in the nature of maintenance charges versus common charges. In a co-op, the maintenance charges include both real estate taxes and almost always a mortgage of some size, usually fairly substantial, so that on average, your maintenance charges are a fairly large monthly number. You know, it's, it's a substantial number that if someone is two, three, four months behind, we're talking some real money here. A condominium, on the other hand, common charges, because they do not include real estate taxes or any mortgage payments, are usually much smaller, and it takes a long time to get up to the arrears where they're, quote, unquote, a problem. You know, if somebody's common charges are $120 a month, you know, four months is not a big deal, as opposed to a maintenance charge of $1,000 a month and you're, you know, $4,000 in the hole on your budget. Conversely, maintenance charges are exceptionally easy to collect as opposed to common charges. In a co-op, the person is a tenant shareholder. Therefore, there is a landlord-tenant relationship which allows the co-op to seek its collection of unpaid maintenance in housing court just as if the person was a rent-stabilized tenant not paying the rent. And in New York, there is actually a special part in the court system specifically for co-ops. And that one judge hears all these cases at least at the resolution level. Um, what this means is that there is a fairly, I will say fast, although it comes with a big caveat, but a reasonable means of enforcing your rights to collect. Condos are not so lucky in New York. Unlike New Jersey, where there's a much better plan, the collection of common charges in New York is at best difficult. 
There is no good system in New York for the collection of common charges. Again, as I noted before, one of the big issues is they grow slowly. They're a lower number. So you're not as motivated and it's not as much of an issue if someone's three, four, five months back. You know, and you have shareholders, your unit owners who are perpetually two, three, four months back, but for five, six hundred dollars, it's just not worth it to go after them. However, there's a reason you really want to do that. In New York, what the procedure is, if a unit owner becomes behind in common charges, the standard procedure would be to file what is called a common charge lien, which is just what it sounds like. It's akin to a mechanics lien, and it's simply a notice that is served on the unit owner, is filed with the county clerk, and it's just like a recorded mortgage. It is a notice to the world that anybody buying, foreclosing, whatever, transferring title to the unit, this debt is owed to condominium. And that's nice, it puts the world on notice, but it gives you no direct enforcement. You can't take that lien and go after a bank account, you can't do anything other than record it at the county clerk's office and jump up and down and yell at the people. So the next step, if you follow the normal legal procedure for condominiums, would be to start a foreclosure action. But here is another critical difference between co-ops and condominiums. In a co-op, the co-op always has the primary lien. As the landlord, you have a first priority interest at any time. No one can have an interest, even the federal government, may not have an interest that supersedes yours. The co-op always comes first. Condominiums is the reverse in many ways. You're last in line after the recorded liens, except those that came after your common charge lien. So you, to enforce a common charge lien for somebody who's six, seven months back in their maintenance and say that totals two, three, four thousand, let's just be generous, we'll say it totals four thousand dollars, have to go to Supreme Court and commence a foreclosure action whereby in order to enforce your lien, you will also have to enforce the bank's lien. Now there are cases where by commencing these actions, the bank will step in as a housekeeping matter and just pay off the liens and add it to their bulk uh, loan. But those are rare. The bank has no great motivation to do this because they're in line ahead of you and if you foreclose, so what? They get paid first. So. By using the standard legal procedures, there's not really any good method to enforce a lien. So we have some alternatives that we suggest to condominiums. And that is that once you file a common charge lien, if the amount is below $5,000, the condominium itself may commence an action in small claims court, which is the simple, for lack of a better term, night court, mostly pro se, legal form where you can enforce small claims against individuals. It's cost effective and it produces at the end of the litigation either a settlement whereby there's an agreement to pay or a judgment, or in fact both, whereby you have a judgment for whatever the common charges do are. You can seek to enforce a judgment against the unit itself, but again, you have the same foreclosure issue you have as you would with a common charge lien. However, the judgment gives you the right to pursue any asset of the unit owner, bank accounts, any other tangible asset that can be seized by a marshal or sheriff. And in a nutshell, when unit owners get litigation, they tend to respond. And it's very rare that these cases ever get to a trial or outright litigation. The key idea is to get them focused on the problem and to pay. Um, for co-ops, it's a much easier road in that they simply go to housing court, they serve their rent demand, they serve what are called petitions and notices of petition, which are the summary proceeding equivalent of a summons and complaint, and as noted before, you go to housing court, you go to the resolution part, and 99 times out of 100, the rents are paid 
or there's a stipulation whereby a payment schedule is entered. But you have the right to, in essence, evict the person. And this makes the shareholder extremely focused on paying their common charges, sorry, maintenance charges, as opposed to a condo owner who, once they get a common charge lien, really has no interest in dealing with it. So the two are very, very different. So, so Dean, what do you do with a shareholder or unit owner who plays this game of always paying up right before they're ready to be evicted? How do you, what advice do you have for a board? Well, this is a very, very common problem. A good question, by the way. Thank you. Um, the, as most managers are well aware of, we all know that most, the vast majority of tenants, shareholders and tenants and unit owners pay their maintenance more or less on time and just treat it as an obligation to be honored. But you're exactly right. There is a core group that every building has. It's your, what we call the regular customers who are always playing the system. They know that if I won't pay, I'll get the rent demand, I'll get a petition, I'll send in half the rent, I'll hold off, I'll send in another half, you know, and this goes on every six months. And there's a very simple system that we've developed that we use, and that is what's called the chronic non-pay holdover. And in landlord-tenant litigation, there's basically two types of cases. There are non-payment actions, which are you're a tenant, you owe rent, we're suing to get you to pay the rent. If you don't pay, you get evicted. Every other case is called a holdover proceeding, and that's based on any breach of the lease not relating directly to failure to pay rent, except the one I'm about to discuss. In the lease, there is a covenant to pay your rent timely. All leases have this language in it, especially all proprietary or leases or occupancy agreements have a language that requires the payment of rent. And this is that classic when you ask people, you always, it's sort of a generational thing. If you ask somebody 50 years or older, when's the rent due, they'll say the first. You ask somebody 30 years or younger, when's the rent due, they'll say the 15th, because that's the day the late charges show up. There's a real fundamental difference in those two kind of mindsets. But at the end of the day, um, people have to, sorry, what was the last half of my question? What do you do with these people? <laughs> well, what do you do? We can't shoot them legally. Um, what you do is you have to train these people to pay rent timely. And what you do is you bring the holdover proceeding based on their breach of the promise to pay timely. And there is, it's an evolved area of law now that's got a pretty clear set of patterns. And my recommendation is if you have a shareholder that you've been in court with three times within the last two years or so, where they've had stiffs, they've broken the stiffs, or they just don't pay and then they pay, is that you bring a chronic non-pay holdover. And what that does is we're terminating your lease based on your failure to pay timely. I don't start these cases with the idea of evicting the person. The concept is to get, to get them to stop being a problem. And that way, what you do is you bring this holdover, you threaten to terminate their tenancy, and then you put them on a stipulation that says, you agree to pay your rent on the first day of every month for the next two years, three years, whatever you can get away with with the court, on time, or you'll be evicted has two great things. One, you know you're not going to be bringing a non-payment case again for two or three years because if they breach, they get evicted. But also, it sort of trains these people to pay their rent on time. And another critical component is, as we all know, these are the guys who hang out in the laundry room and talk about, I haven't paid my rent in six months, and everyone knows about them. Well, suddenly they're paying their rent on time, and that's a fact that gets around the co-op just about as fast as they're not paying. Just as nothing like getting one person evicted out of your co-op to make the other ten, you know, uh, scoff law folks get current in a hurry. So that brings me to the second part of what I want to discuss, and that is the proactive nature of collection management and things that I recommend you do as part of that process. And I guess I'll start off with one of the ideas is when do you start this process? And when do you start litigation? In my view, when a shareholder is 15 days past due on their maintenance charges or their common charges for a condo, again, depending on the size of the building, either the manager should stop by, call, 
or a letter should be written just saying, we noticed your rent payment isn't due, is, hasn't been made timely. Is something wrong? Do you want to discuss this? Please make the payment. Goes on to 30 days, you're now in your second month, and the rent's not paid, you're two months back. Then I think the more demanding, essentially, collection letter needs to be sent out. And that is, you owe us two months, you're in breach, if you don't pay or make arrangements to pay, legal action will be commenced. And there's a nuance here that managers need to be very clearly aware of when you send out these letters. And that's the Fair Debt or Credit Protection Act. And that is the law uh, in the federal statute about being a debt collector. And as the law was somewhat broadly drafted, managers and attorneys as well um, cannot send out these demands for collection without all these federal requirements kicking in. And the one you need to be most aware of is if you mess up and get tagged as being a debt collector and not complying, there's a $1,000 fine, which is bearable, except that it also comes with all the legal fees incurred. And since you're talking federal litigation, and there's a certain landlord tenant firm known to many people in the New York area who got tagged very severely on this issue. And that's why rent demands to tenants are now signed by a member of the board or an authorized agent, usually the manager designated as an assistant secretary. Because attorneys used to sign these rent demands. And in the commercial setting, you still can. But if you send out these notices, they have to be sent out from the co-op and signed by an officer or director of the co-op. And that can be the general manager acting in his capacity as the assistant secretary. But do not send out a demand letter saying pay the rent or else and sign it manager. You know, unless you're an employee of the co-op or agent, you know, managing agent. That is a red flag and you will, you know, legal aid attorneys will get very excited to get those letters. You do the letters, they don't pay. My philosophy and my recommendation to most of my clients, absent, you know, they're like a four unit building or something, but if you have a standard size building, is the first week of the third month of arrears. Somebody is now, you're in the first week of the third month, they owe three months maintenance, they have not come on, they have not made an explanation of why, nor have they sent in a payment. They need a rent demand. And that is the notice that you have served on them by a process server that says you owe X amount of rent consisting of the following items, and if you don't pay in three days, we will commence summary proceedings. For my larger clients, we have a program where we actually have them do their rent demands in-house. You know, this saves you money, and it's a much more efficient way of doing it because, in essence, it allows the co-op to generate the rent demands themselves. You, hunt, you train, you get one of your employees or security guards or whomever to get their process server's license and have them serve process for you. And basically the rent demands are done on Tuesday, served on Wednesday, and the shareholders are usually in the office Thursday trying to get these things worked out. It's a very efficient system and I highly recommend it for the larger co-ops that have, you know, an arrears issue. But again, the thing I like to stress here is early active intervention will prevent you having to do a lot of work on the back end. And that is every shareholder or unit owner, you get to come in that first or second month and work out a payout plan or make arrangements so it's addressed. Is unit owners, you're not spending legal fees and management time on to get the rent paid, nor do the arrears get out of control. In manufacturing, there is a theory called Six Sigma which is the concept of quality control and production. And that is, if you make your system work efficiently at the front end, you control quality in the front of the process, you save a lot of time and effort and money on the back end of the process. And that's very true in collections management. What you want to do is you want to proactively engage the unit owners in addressing the problem before the problem gets out of hand. And besides saving money and managing the problem, it's good management board relations with the unit owners and shareholders. Because once people start giving nasty attorney letters and rent demands, you know, it puts an, a, a bad taste in their mouth about their relationship with the shareholder or with the co-op, as opposed to the shareholder coming in, meeting with the manager, and saying, look, I got laid off. I can do this. 
the three months, can you cut me some slack, I'll pay this month for a month, and then I'll catch up over the back three months. That is a much better system for them and a much better system for you. So, so there are a couple of questions that came in uh, while you were speaking. Uh, one of them says, condos, co-ops, many of them have either interest or late fees of some kind that they uh, add on if somebody's in arrears. What's your advice to a board on, for lack of a better phrase, cutting a deal with somebody and waiving some of those fees? Is this a good precedent, a bad idea? What do you think? I think it's oftentimes driven on a, on a building-wide sort of case-by-case -case basis in that, look, if someone, there needs to be penalties and consequences for defaulting in your obligations under your lease or your declaration. You know, if you don't pay, there should be a consequence. But rational behavior also has to get into the picture, and that is if you have a late fee of, you know, 5% per month and the guy says, look, I'll pay $100 over $200, you know what? I say get the money in. You know, if he's a repeat offender, punish him. But if it's a first-time person who has an excuse, this is a this is a, a feature where a large dose of common sense needs to be applied. And that is, look, collect a reasonable fee, waive part of it if it gets the deal done. Because again, the whole concept of this, as we try to manage collections, is to minimize the time, expense, and effort that the problem creates. You want to essentially resolve the problem as early in the process as you can. And if waiving half the late fees gets it done in month two, as opposed to collect the late fees but waive the legal fees that you can't get from court in month six, I'd say get the deal done. So one of, one of the other listeners has asked this question. They, they want to understand what is a bank's obligation here. If you have a condo and a bank forecloses against the unit who hasn't been paying the association, does the bank have to pay the past due charges to include common charges, legal fees, or fines? Ooh, that is a much trickier question than it sounds like. Because if it is a, if it is a short sale, i.e. the bank forecloses and on their million dollar loan collects $500,000, the co-op normally gets its lien extinguished because it is behind the bank. There are ways to finesse that and get around it. But there are some cases where the bank, where the condo will lose its common charges, which is another reason why, again, I advocate jumping on it early in the process, and if they're in foreclosure, doing whatever you can to help expedite that process. So is, is the answer the same for co-ops and condos? No. Co-ops are different in that, again, the co-op, as said earlier, has a first priority lien. You are always number one. So. In that situation, say there's a million-dollar co-op and it sells for $500,000 and the co-op is owed $100,000, the co-op gets $100,000. The co-op almost always is made whole. The flip side of that is, is when a co-op forecloses on a unit through non-payment and maintenance and evicts the shareholder, some shareholders, some co-ops don't quite understand that they don't get the whole apartment. Under the law, what happens is, again, the apartment is sold as an auction or however it's dealt with. Once it's liquidated, the co-op is made whole. It gets all maintenance, all legal fees, all paperclip fees, anything incurred in the transfer and collection of this case. But if there's $100,000 left over after all that process, it goes to whoever's next with a lien. Or if there's no lien, it goes to the ex-shareholder. It's not a windfall to the co-op. Interesting. So let's go back. Uh, one of the listeners asked a question that deals with accounting. So let's go back to Annette for a minute. And the question is, can a line of credit be used to replace the need to have a reserve fund or to supplement a building that has a small reserve fund? Yes, that's a good question. Um, again, putting aside the FHA requirements, let's assume that the building is not interested in being FHA compliant you know, for the loans. Um, if that's the case, a line of credit, best practices probably would be that a line of credit would be used to supplement a small reserve fund. I don't know if in any case you want any size building, large or small, not to have any reserve cash on hand at all. So in other words, I think best practices would say not to use a line of credit to be the only source of funds, that the building should have some funds on hand. And it's very possible that the bank, 
if they see that a building has no reserves or cash on hand at all, you know, it'd be much more difficult to get that line of credit to begin with because there's not as much collateral. And I do see wants to add something. Although one thing to be on, on that issue is not only are lines of credit more difficult to get now than they have been historically, but two years back, lines of credit were being reduced. Right. So if you relied on your line of credit for your capital account and suddenly it gets whacked in half, right. you have real issues. Yeah, I, I think in a nutshell, what board members and man you know, managers really need to understand is unfortunately the common charges and the maintenance charges are going to have to go up to some degree so that there really is going to be cash flow available over the next few years to take care of the projects that need to be taken care of. Taking into account that there might be some people that might not be able to handle the increase and there could be a bad debt effect as, as the current charges go up. But, you know, we really need to maintain the buildings and get the right amount of cash in. So we promised you that we would be done by uh, 8 o'clock. Um, first of all, I'd really like to thank Dean for his insights on the collection process. I'd like to thank Annette for uh, speaking to us about the budget area. Our contact information is uh, on the screen. We hope this was uh, useful to you. Unfortunately, we couldn't answer all of the questions that we received during uh, 